Chief Executive Officer at FHI 360, it's a real pleasure to welcome each of you uh, to the U.S. launch of the INEE Conflict Sensitive Education PAC. Um, before we get into the specifics, I want to say thanks to everybody that has worked hard on putting today's event together. And while I must note that Save the Children and FHI 360 uh, have worked together with the INEE Secretariat to co-host this meeting today, um, I recognize that the overall effort to serve the educational needs of the 28 million girls and boys who live in conflict-affected fragile states engages literally thousands of individuals and organizations in over 170 countries around the world. This is an undertaking that probably more than any other has the participants taking off their hats, I'm told, when they step into the space. And they engage as individuals committed to the goal of providing educational opportunities to children in very difficult circumstances. So it's more than an organizational identity. It's the identity that each of us feels for the importance of this particular undertaking and goal. I recognize uh, most of you attending today represent organizations that are members of the Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies, and that is INEE, -E, for those of you that were not aware. This is truly a remarkable network that has accomplished a lot in the last decade to ensure that organizations all over the world are more effective in delivering educational programs to the multitudes of children whose learning is disrupted by conflict, a natural disaster. From the development of the minimum standards for education, preparedness, response, and recovery, to the tools that will be introduced today on conflict-sensitive education, INEE -E has provided the space and the environment for educators from donors, NGOs, academia, the ministries of education to work together to ensure that as a community of practice we are implementing programs that have common standards that are derived from shared best practices and research. So there's evidence behind uh, the approaches that are taken. The work of INNE not only has served to equip emergency educators with appropriate tools to improve their work, that is tools such as we are talking about today, but has also put education in conflict affected and crisis situations on the global agenda. The Education Cannot Wait advocacy campaign is uh, the most recent e example. I'm sure that all of us are proud to participate in this worthy endeavor and to contribute to the INEE's work. I'm therefore really pleased and honored to introduce uh, the director of INNE, and that is uh, INEE, -E, and that is Dr. Lori Henninger, who will MC today's proceedings. Lori has been director of INNE since May 2010, and worked on education in emergencies uh, during her time with the Women's Refugee Com Commission. Everyone uh, who has observed her in her roles. And I, just in the last few minutes, actually, having had the opportunity to meet her, I think we all realize that she is a sub superb master of her craft. I can tell that in just chatting with her. She is the consummate convener and team builder. She brings people together from uh, very different cultures and diverse kinds of organizations to share expertise and tools that will really make a difference 
in the lives of children who are impacted by conflict by helping them achieve opportunities in education. So Laurie, welcome. Thank you. I'm so touched, I have to say. Um, Al, thank you so much. Um, and audience members and participants, welcome. It is my great pleasure to um, welcome you all to the U.S. launch of the INEE Conflict Sensitive Education PAC. Um, I'd like to <clears throat> I'd like to extend a special welcome to our two keynote speakers, Carol Bellamy and Christy Vilsack. Uh, Carol is the former chair of the board for the Global Partnership for Education, and Christy is uh, the, I, I'm sorry, Christy? Senior advisor for education for USAID, four months on the job and just doing wonderfully well. Thank you for being here today. Um, I want to thank also all of our panelists and moderators um, for participating in the event and uh, for their conf uh, commitment to conflict-sensitive education. A special thank you to FHI 360 and to Save the Children for taking leadership to organize this event, and a special thanks um, to uh, to Ken Rhodes and Rachel McKinney for their work pulling this together uh, and to Al for the use of the space and FHI 360's commitment to the work. Um, the final thank you is uh, to USAID and USAID's funding made this work possible. Over the past two years, INEE members have developed the Conflict Sensitive Education PAC. This was created by both working groups of INEE, the Working Group on Minimum Standards and Network Tools, and the Working Group on Conflict Sensitive Education, which involve over 40 organizational representatives <coughs> putting their heads and hearts together to build the tools. The Conflict Sensitive Education PAC has been designed to promote education that contributes to social transformation, inclusion, and mutual understanding, thus fostering the development of peace. The PAC was officially launched in April in Paris in conjunction with UNESCO IIEP with around 200 high-level representatives from ministries of education, UN agencies, NGOs, and donors in attendance. We are hopeful that the tools in this pack, in the Conflict Sensitive Education Pack, or the CSE Pack, which you may hear it referred to from now on today, um, will be useful to each one of you, whether it's for grant making, for policy development, or for program creation. INEE members, which a lot of you are, and can I just see a show of hands of who is a member of INEE? That's a wonderful thing. And if you're not a member, you can come and see me, and I can tell you how you can become a member. And it's free, so there's not, and there's really no obligation. Um, but we do love participation. Uh, so the, um, the INEE membership, as you can see here, will continue to promote the conflict-sensitive education pack throughout upcoming initiatives, including the high-level Education Cannot Wait meeting during the UN General Assembly this fall. The presentations and discussions today, I know, will inspire all of us to identify practical strategies and ideas drawing on the shared experiences and good practice from various partners. Once again, I would like to thank you all for your contributions to making this event happen. Let us continue to work together to ensure that conflict-sensitive education becomes a reality. Education cannot wait because the future of our children cannot wait. You can follow this launch um, on Twitter at hashtag CSE launch, and it's also being uh, broadcast, is it being broadcast on the web? It's being broadcast on the web, that's what I thought. Okay, 
My next job, now that I have done my welcomes and thank yous and introductions, is to review the agenda and the speakers. And you can see behind me, and thankfully I can see in front of me right here, so I don't have to talk like this, um, the, the agenda for the day. Um, the, as soon as I conclude, which I hope to do very soon, uh, I will introduce Cynthia Coons and Howard Williams to explain how the PAC has come to be, why it has come to be, and what's in it, so that you all can take that information and move it forward. Um, we have two wonderful keynote speakers, as I indicated earlier, Carol Bellamy and Christy Vilsack. Um, Carol will talk about the international implications for conflict-sensitive education in the PAC, and Christy will focus on the U.S. Uh, implications for the PAC and the work. And then this morning, we had um, a multi-hour um, workshop on using the conflict sensitive education pack and we have a, a panel of four people moderated by Eric Eversman including Joe Kelsey, Mary Mendenhall and Jennifer Sklar who will talk about the experience of what it meant to be in that workshop and how 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 that all went and how they could see using the pack in their work. We'll have a question and answer period um, and then at 4.15, uh, I would invite you all to stay for a reception from 4.15 to 5 so that you can mix and mingle and, um, and talk to one another <coughs> about what you've heard and how you can use the material moving forward. So with that, um, we have a short video on the Conflict Sensitive Education Pack, and we will show that now. Lori, thank you. The challenge. Children and youth living in countries affected by violence and armed conflict are not realizing their right to education. Right now, there are 61 million children worldwide out of primary school. 28 million of these children live in conflict-affected, fragile states. In these areas, millions of young people lack the skills needed for employment. 20 million girls are out of school, and girls account for only 30% of the refugees enrolled in secondary school. Widespread sexual violence, targeted attacks on schools, and other abuses prevent children and youth from gaining access to quality, relevant, and safe education. Despite the importance and critical need for education in conflict areas, education is one of the least supported sectors in the humanitarian response. Only 2% of all humanitarian aid goes to education. Why consider conflict dynamics in education policies and programs? If the challenges faced in these contexts are not considered, education can increase tensions and conflicts. For example, education was used to incite ethnic hatred in Rwanda, contributing to the 1994 genocide. Or in Liberia, the long-term mass exclusion of indigenous children from the formal education system contributed to the outbreak of conflict in 1989. Education policies and programs should be conflict sensitive they should minimize negative impacts and maximize contributions to peace building. Education can play a critical role in mitigating violence by challenging exclusion and marginalization. A country which has 10 percentage points more of its youth in schools reduces risk of conflict by about 4 percentage points. Inclusive, equal, quality and safe access to education can support nation building, social cohesion, and positive values in children and youth. 
How can education stakeholders implement conflict-sensitive education? The Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies, INI, has developed a set of guiding principles on the integration of conflict sensitivity in education policy and programming. These guiding principles are the result of the collaboration between 26 organizations. They provide a common framework to ensure children's access to quality and equitable education. The principles are accompanied by a diagnostic tool and the I Need Guidance Note on Conflict Sensitive Education. What can you do now? Adopt the I Need Guiding Principles. Use the I Need tools and ensure that your education interventions do not exacerbate tensions and conflict. And remember that conflict sensitive education helps us advance quality education for all. I just, I love the photos in, a lot of the photos in that video. I just think the, the faces of the kids are just extraordinary. Um, moving into introducing the Conflict Sensitive Education Pack, um, I'm going to introduce Howard Williams and Cynthia Coons. Um, Howard will present the context and the background of the Conflict Sensitive Education Pack, sort of the why. Howard has 30 years of experience in education development in multiple countries, including conflict-affected and fragile states such as Nepal, Liberia, and Egypt. Howard is with the American Institutes for Research and will, in the very near future, be working in Liberia. Cynthia will present um, the specifically on the tools She'll demonstrate sort of the what and the how of the Conflict Sensitive Education Pack. Cynthia has 10 years experience delivering education in emergency contexts. She's managed global programs for education in conflict-affected fragile states for UNICEF and for Save the Children. She's provided technical assistance uh, or conducted evaluations in conflict-affected countries including Kyrgyzstan, Armenia, Guatemala, Kosovo, Haiti, Nepal, OPT. I didn't write down the whole list because there's a lot of them. She's done a lot of work in a lot of different contexts. Um, recently, she developed the INEE guidance note on conflict-sensitive education for the PAC. Cynthia has been a consultant for INEE many times and is just very, very good at what she does. So with that, I would like the two of you to please come up. Hi, thank you, Laurie. And good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you here. Why is there a need to focus on conflict-sensitive education? I have a clicker. If I can use it, I'll find out why. Excellent. We all agree that access to quality education is a human right. And we know that the right to education is not being fully realized, and it's further compromised in conflict settings. Education and conflict have a bi-directional and complex relationship in which each can affect the other in a positive or a negative way. Education programs and policies in conflict affected and fragile context should be conflict sensitive to ensure that we do no harm and that through education we can support safety, learning, resilience, stability, development, and peace. So how does education affect conflict? It could be mitigating or contributing. The distribution of education resources, for example, tangible or intangible, affects intergroup relationships. Which population groups are provided access to a safe quality education? Where are the schools? Where are the good schools? The distribution of education resources affects markets and supply chains. Which students and graduates will have a chance to participate meaningfully in the economy? We can make a connection to the youth bulge in the Middle East an education system designed specifically for white-collar jobs, the reduction of white-collar jobs, 
and the Arab Spring. The distribution of education resources legitimizes actors and agendas. Who gets the resources in education tells us who's considered important and who's considered unimportant if they're considered at all. The distribution of education resources incentivizes continuation of a context in which it is given. Are teachers hired based on legitimate credentials and their ability to help children learn? Or are they hired based on patronage, political affiliation, or racial or, or language groups? And finally, teaching and curriculum affect knowledge, attitudes, and values. Are the learning standards and curricula designed to help students become resilient, tolerant, and contributing citizens? When we consider what is conflict education, it's a process to understand the context in with, in with, in with, within which education is operating. It's to analyze the relationship between context and education, and then it allows us to act to minimize the negative impact and maximize the positive impact of education on conflict. The key concepts around conflict-sensitive education are the conflict analysis. We discussed earlier this morning, if you say conflict analysis to people who have been through conflict, it may, may associate with laying blame. In fact, it's analysis to understand what's happened in the conflict and the current dynamics. It's a systematic study of the background history, the root causes, the actors, and the dynamics of a conflict. Then the conflict and, and affected and fragile context. Is any situation impacted or expected to be impacted by violence or armed conflict? And finally, peace building activities, including education, that aim explicitly to address the root causes of conflict and contribute to peace at large. Our conflict, Cynthia, our conflict. <laughs> our colleague, <laughs> our colleague, <laughs> Cynthia, will introduce what actions we can take to ensure that our education programs and policies are conflict sensitive. So what is in the conflict sensitive education pack? We have three elements, the guiding principles, a guidance note, and a reflection tool. The guiding principles are six. It's a one pager. You all have, should have the copy in your folder. And this is to ensure that conflict sensitivity is incorporated into education proposals, policies, and programs. It's an advocacy tool. The guidance note is a more comprehensive document. It can be used for capacity building or training. And it offers strategies for developing and implementing conflict-sensitive education programs and policies according to the INEE minimum standards for education and emergencies. And the third element is a reflection tool. This is an applied tool, maybe 10 pages or so, that you can use during the, oh, seem to be, okay. A um, reflection tool that you can use during assessment, design, implementation, management, or monitoring and evaluation phases of the program cycle. So let's go through each of the three tools individually. The guiding principles. These are useful to ensure that conflict sensitivity is incorporated in proposals and policies, and it's a commitment these agencies are making to promote and ensure that their education programs that are being delivered are not contributing to tensions or intergroup tensions or violence, but are promoting peace and connectors. The six principles. Number one is assess. Make sure to develop an education and conflict analysis that inform the education intervention. Assess how conflict affects education, but also how education might contribute to conflict. The second principle is do no harm. Ensure that education does not favor one group over another. Perpetuate gender or social inequities, or is manipulated to promote hatred or exclusion. Make sure that the education interventions respond to the particular context and prioritize community participation. Principle number three, prioritize prevention. Ensure the protection of students, education personnel, infrastructure, and learning environments are safe from attack. Provide alternative education for youth and adults 
who have been left out of the education system. Focus on emergency preparedness, but most importantly, ensure prevention by protecting, preparing, and planning. Principle number four, promote equity and the holistic development of the child. Ensure that services are distributed equitably across identity groups and reach those that have been marginalized. Train teachers on peace education curricula and pedagogy to ensure that education goes beyond numeracy and literacy, but also includes the crucial skills of responsible citizenship, conflict transformation, and resilience. Principle five, stabilize, rebuild, and build the education system. Focus on strengthening institutional capacities and in the national and local levels. Make sure that the number of trained teachers reflects the diversity in the society and ensure that systems are transparent and that all stakeholders are held accountable. Make sure that education is delivered according to the INEE minimum standards for education, the widely recognized global tool that articulates the minimum acceptable level of education quality and access in context of emergency through to recovery. And finally, development partners should act fast, respond to change, and stay engaged beyond short-term support. Move away from short-term approaches and into long-term approaches. Include transition plans. Pay attention to new constituencies that require attention, such as child soldiers, refugees, returnees, demobilized youth, and adults and be ready to adjust programs if they are doing harm and adapt them to ensure that they are indeed contributing to stabilization and peace building. And now we will show you a short Prezi on the six principles for conflict sensitive education. indeed a very brief present. <laughs> Is it all clear to you now? <laughs> Let's go to the reception. <laughs> okay, so we will skip the present and I will move on to the second tool, which is the INEE guidance note. As I mentioned earlier, the guidance note is a more comprehensive document and it includes strategies for conflict-sensitive education according to the five domains of the INEE minimum standards. We emphasize in the um, guidance note that conflict sensitivity applies across all phases of conflict and all levels of education. And within the guidance note, there are a variety of tools that you can use, including a reference list of conflict sensitive tools uh, and conflict sensitive tools specific to education, as well as some case studies of what our colleagues have learned when they've been trying to apply these tools in the field, and also a quick reference tool it gives you bullets of conflict-sensitive education strategies according to the INEE minimum standards categories. So just to give you a brief look at some of the content that's in the INEE guidance note, this is one of the domains of the INEE minimum standards, the access and learning environment domain. And in this domain, for conflict when we apply a conflict-sensitive lens, first we focus on that our activities must be informed by a conflict analysis. A conflict analysis should identify the dividers and connectors in a society and look at how our education program or policy may interact with those dividers and connectors. After we've done the conflict analysis, 
when we're working in the realm of access and learning environment, we f may first focus on access for all. And in a conflict-affected, fragile environment, that would mean promoting access for all children, including IDPs, host communities, non-dominant language groups, and former child soldiers, to name just a few. A second element of work would be communicate continuously. In conflict situations, information is changing and it's very dynamic. And in order to, main to maintain that our programs are not contributing to violence, we need to communicate continuously with the um, areas in which we work to understand their perceptions and adapt our program as needed. Monitor perceptions. Continuously monitor the perceptions of work, not just what is being done, but how is it being perceived? Who are we hiring? How is that group perceived in the local community where we're actually delivering education? Um, who, from whom are we procuring our education resources? And how is that group perceived by the community where we're delivering the textbooks or materials? And a fourth element we might consider is to give life-saving information. Distribute to learning community protective information, for example, how to identify unexploded ordnance expo or explosive remnants of war. The third tool in the INEE CSE pack is the reflection tool. It actually has quite a long title, you can see there, but I've just minimized it to the reflection tool for the time being. This is designed for education program staff and other stakeholders concerned with education in conflict-affected fragile contexts. And it can be used to ensure that conflict sensitivity is integrated in education at all stages of the program cycle, from design through evaluation and feedback to the community. It's organized in three columns, as you can see there in the graphic on the right. And it's a series of questions according to each of the phases of the program cycle to help our staff reflect on the conflict sensitivity of a, a current program or a program that's being designed. So to give you an example of what the questions might be like at each of the phases, I pulled out the questions for the assessment phase. Have education stakeholders analyzed the conflict context and how the proposed education program and conflict may interact. Question two, does the analysis include different perspectives of stakeholders within the education community? And question three, does the analysis include an understanding of how different stakeholders are both affected by and also drive conflict? So you can see these types of reflection questions could be used throughout the program design process and through the program um, delivery phase and could be used at different levels of an agency, at the implementer level for staff to reflect on what's currently be done, being done or at the um, higher design level or proposal development level. So that was a very brief summary of the three elements of the INEE Conflict Sensitive Education Pack. You can find that and those three and many more resources on conflict sensitive education on the INE website. And the Education and Fragility Working Group specifically has developed quite a library of resources that are posted for sharing there. Um, as Lori mentioned, you can become a member of INEE and keep tabs on how the CSE work is being promoted and, and developed globally. And we always like to hear your experience with the tools that are collectively developed by INE members. So please share your experiences with us as you apply these tools in your work and let us know um, your comments and inputs. Thank you so much um, to both of you for, for that really good and very brief keeping in time um, explanation of the pack. I realized that when I sat down that I left my glasses up here. I also realized I left my pen up here and now I brought another. I think every time I come up, by the time I'm done, I'll have a big pile of pens up here. <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker, uh, Carol Bellamy. 
uh, Carol is one of those people that if somebody did one of the things that she did, has done, they would have a very full career. Um, Carol has managed to pack three or four lifetimes into one lifetime and to make a huge difference during that lifetime, which is still going strong, I want to say. This is not a eulogy. Um, <laughs> Carol was a Peace Corps volunteer uh, in Guatemala from 1963 to 1965. And then she was also director of the Peace Corps from 1993 to 95. She was executive director of, the, of UNICEF from 1995 to 2005, president and CEO of World Learning. In 2009, she was appointed as chair of the International Baccalaureate Board of Governors. She has recently left her post as chair of the Global Partnership for Education, where she made a huge difference in the structure and the function and the reach of the Global Partnership. At UNICEF, Carol Bellamy is, created, is credited with having left behind a fiscally sound organization with strong internal controls. She doubled UNICEF's resources from roughly 800 million in 1994 to more than 1.8 billion in 2004. Carol was elected to the New York State Senate in 1972, representing the Brooklyn District. In 1977, she was elected the first female president of the New York City Council, a position she held until 1985. Um, Carol attended Gettysburg College, where she was a member of Delta Gamma and graduated in 1963. She earned her law degree from New York University School of Law in 1968. Carol, welcome. another pen for you, Lord. Thank you. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. Um, uh, I want to try and avoid being too repetitious. I'm not sure why we need uh, keynote speakers, actually, because this is about launching the, um, uh, the pack. But nevertheless, first of all, a shout out to FHI 360 and INEE and Save the Children and everybody who's been involved in this, because I think this is really a very uh, important effort. Uh, I'm delighted to, to be here once again talking on these issues with Christy Vilsack. Uh, I think we're the, if you're really old, the Bob and Ray or maybe the Simon and Garfunkel of, um, um, or more recently, I don't know, uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce of um, <laughs> children in, in conflict. But it's nice to be here again, uh, Christy, uh, with you. Um, uh, I, I don't want to repeat the statistics that you all know already, although I'm going to do a little um, thinking back on where we've come. Um, because I was thinking, actually, it's now, I actually joined UNICEF almost 20 years ago, but I, I recall in my UNICEF days just getting anybody to think about education in conflict was, it wasn't on anybody's agenda at that point. Um, uh, it wasn't on the donors' agenda. The donors, I mean, um, health was, sat in both the development um, drawer but also the emergencies drawer. Um, but education only sat in the development drawer and in the donors, remember, the development um, uh, department was on the seventh floor and the emergencies department was on the twelfth floor. They never talked to each other and these just weren't issues. It wasn't limited to donors, frankly, even in international organizations or NGOs in the field getting development folks to talk to humanitarian folks was impossible and then if you threw in, a, in an educrat who didn't talk to anybody, um, again, we, these issues were not out there, and, and really, even though we knew, and we knew certainly as we thought more about child protection, the importance of bringing some kind of normalcy uh, into this really abnormal situation, um, um, these issues just were not uh, front and center. So I think the good news, I always like to have a little good news, is that education is in general moving back up the international agenda. And I also think, and we talked about it last week at the USAID conference, that the, that the, the subject at least of education in conflict affected countries, wherever that conflict is, because it's not a linear process, um, is at least uh, receiving uh, more attention. Um, it's, the, it's, it's included in the focus on the UN Secretary General's uh, Global Education First initiative. Um, the um, Education Can't Wait work um, that has been so promoted by INEE, in which many of us are involved, uh, 
the Global Partnership for Education now actually getting some mud on their boots rather than just fluff on their, their shoes when they get out there and actually uh, um, get involved in, 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 in really education sector plans that, uh, that are thinking about uh, how to avoid risk in the first place but also how to deal with these, with these issues. So the good news is that, 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 that the, the subject at least now, in my view, is uh, much more front and center than it has been. That being said, <coughs> I, I think it's also fair and honest to say that uh, as we see a continuing um, uh, improvement, at least in enrollment numbers of more children in school, I'm not talking about whether any of them are learning anything, but uh, or the decrease in out of school uh, children, the fact is the percentage of the remaining out of school children that are in conflict affected countries is increasing. So the percentage is increasing. And at the same time, while it's been the least funded area, the funding is even decreasing. So, so, so I say to myself, why isn't, um, it, while, while we are at least now acknowledging the subject, why isn't the subject of education in conflict affected affected countries higher up on the global to-do list, um, particularly when children in fragile and conflict-affected states are nearly, and you saw it there, three times more likely to be out of primary school than children in other low-income countries, and when these countries have some of the lowest literacy uh, levels in the world. Why isn't it more of a priority when there isn't one single fragile or conflict-affected state that is on, tra on track to reach even one of the Millennium Development Goals? So, that brings me to today's subject because I think that perhaps what has been missing from the debate so far is the how. I know, um, Lori, when you were introducing before, you talked about the what and where and how, but I think maybe what's been missing so far is the how. How exactly to deliver a good quality education for children in the most difficult of circumstances. So that's why I am excited to be here, and that's why it's refreshing to join you today to celebrate what I consider, to, uh, consider a really positive development, something that propels beyond the list of the very severe challenges and actually begins to look at solutions. It doesn't just say this is a challenge, it starts to look at solutions. I love everything about this pack, but there are some things that I like in particular, and I'm going to tell you what they are. You've already heard them, but I'm going to tell you what I like. First, here is what works. Here is, what's, here is something that people can actually use. Here we have guidance on how exactly to build and deliver conflict-sensitive education programs at every level and in every type and phase of conflict. This is exactly what is needed by ministries and ministers, by international organizations like UNICEF, by donors like the Global Partnership for Education, and ultimately, frankly, by the teachers who will put all of this into practice. Here is something that really grasps the importance of education, not only during conflict, important as that is, to give children a sense of normalcy and security, but also as a vital element in both conflict prevention and in post-conflict recovery. We know that what works in one situation may falter in another, and that one size it's all approaches struggle in situations that change on an almost daily basis, and that's what we're talking about, situations that change on an almost daily basis. Here, again, as you just heard, the PAC provides a reflection tool, a reflection tool to help us think about the ways in which shifting conflict dynamics affect schooling and how conflict sensitivity can be embedded right through the project cycle. So it isn't a one-size-fits-all. It gives you this tool. There's a welcome and down-to-earth reality about this particular aspect of the PAC, a pragmatic recognition that education is linked not only to peace, but also to war. We talk about that too seldom. Education can be twisted and warped by those with a partisan agenda of intolerance. This requires our constant, constant vigilance and our acknowledging that it can happen. This PAC moves us much further forward than peace education alone. Ugh, for years, I, <laughs> I was happy with peace education, but it didn't take us very far. This moves us further than peace education. Peace education was fine, but it didn't take us very far. It reflects a different mindset with a good 
quality education seen as a fundamental ingredient for peace, positioned at the heart of the policy, programming, and governance measures that we need to prevent and respond to conflict. That is quite a shift from seeing schools as places where children learn about peace. Valid as that remains, that was a very limited, narrow, very good, but very limited, narrow. Now we're talking about quality education. Most of all, I like the fact that this PAC has not, dropped, has not just dropped from the sky, has not just been parachuted in as if from nowhere. It has emerged from a process that has revitalized interest on education in conflict-affected countries. It is, as such, a crucial third stage in a whole, whole process of collaboration and dialogue. And in, by be, being part of that, in my view, there is much greater ownership, and we will see it brought to scale to a much greater degree. First, we had, and we've heard about it, we, heard that we had the Declaration of Commitment to Conflict-Sensitive Education at the Paris meeting. Uh, the global promise, if you like. This was underpinned by the guiding principles endorsed by ministers at that same meeting, the way in which we will keep that global promise. Simple, clear principles, again, something that we have to build back into education. Not dumbing it down, but simplicity, so that people actually understand. The way in which we will uh, reach those and keep that global promise. So simple, clear principles on conflict sensitivity in education that span everything from robust assessment so that we know actually what is needed to responding at speed so that children don't miss vital learning time. Remember the average conflict today lasts, this is average lasts 12 years. I mean, frankly, I'm trying to think of any that have lasted that short a time, uh, but that's the figure we use for the average, certainly not not a period of time that children can be put on hold or asked to wait before they get their education. Being flexible and nimble enough to respond to fast-changing situations without losing sight over the need of the need for long-term engagement, for staying put once a conflict is over. And now, with this new pack, we have the tools to turn these promises and principles into tangible action for children on the ground, to embed them in education policies and programming. So that's why I'm excited about this. I think that this has the potential, because it's, it's really come, come up through all of you and others, I think this has the potential um, to be both put and used in practice. I'm excited about the prospect of a shift from talking about the children who miss out on school because of conflict to concrete action that will actually restore them to a learning environment. Now I turn it over to Christy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> this, this pen collector desk scotch. Um, so the Conflict Sensitive Education Pact now has the Carol Bellamy stamp of approval, and that is a wonderful thing. Um, and I, one of the things that Carol said that I think is, is critical to me as director of INEE is that this pack was made by a large group of the best minds around conflict sensitive education and education in emergencies. And that's what makes it so strong, is that it's not just one or two or three people coming together from on high to say, this is how it should be done. It's practitioners in the field, it's policymakers and others who have taken off their institutional hats and come together with the best interest of children, youth, and adults in mind around ensuring conflict sensitivity in education. So that's, that's where this all comes from. Now I would like to introduce Christy Vilsack. Thank goodness her title is up on the screen so I don't have to flub again. Um, Christy is Senior Advisor for International Education with USAID. Christy graduated from Kirkland College in Clinton, New York in 1972 and earned a master's degree in journalism from the University of Iowa in 1992. 
The Vilsacks moved to Mount Pleasant in 1975. She began her career there as a librarian and a teacher. For 18 years, she taught at the middle school level and also at the high school level, leading classes in language arts and journalism. For another six years, she taught English and journalism at Iowa Wesleyan College. So she is an educator through and through. Christy has worked as a reporter and columnist for the Mount Pleasant News. And she is married to former Iowa governor and current United States Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsnack. She served as the first lady of Iowa from 1999 through 2007. Christy, we are so pleased to have you with us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, one of my hardest jobs at USAID is uh, remembering my own title and also dealing with all the acronyms that I have to deal with. And so to start off, I want to thank INEE -E and also um, FHI 360 and Save the Children uh, for making sure that, that I could be here on behalf of USAID today. Um, I want to tell you about Abraham Awalovich. I met him last week. He is one of the lost boys of Sudan. And he has earned his master's degree from, um, from Syracuse University and is now has started his own foundation and is a leader in the newest country in the world, South Sudan. Um, he was telling us a story of how uh, at eight or nine years old he still had not learned to read and he found himself in a refugee camp and so really the first word that he ever saw and it wasn't really a word it was an acronym actually was USAID because he saw the the class pans which you saw flashed up here a little while ago the symbol of USAID on the bags of food that came to him uh, so every day uh, the bags were opened and there were these clasped hands and the acronym USAID and eventually in the refugee camp he learned to read and and it was there that he realized what USAID meant and so the unlocking of that first word for any child is especially important. And he is from one of, the, one of those conflict and crisis countries that we're all here to discuss. Um, we're really proud that USAID is the uh, largest bilateral donor in the world to education. And our specialty really is that helping hand. We have uh, a lot of people who are technicians. Uh, we focus on monitoring and evaluation. We focus on research and uh, database information. Uh, we check everything out before we invest in it because we have to make sure that the American taxpayers know what we're doing. Um, but for me, because I'm new to USAID and because my background has always been in domestic education, I think that symbol of the helping hand of those clasped hands is really important, except for me, I get to see every day the faces that go with those clasped hands. And so, you know, I know uh, Yolande Miller Granvaux, who would have loved to have been here today, and Nina um, Papadopoulos, who would have loved to have been here today, because they're the ones who've been working for the last two years to create the pack that you have. And it was, it was really Yolande, and I wish that I could do, because she's so passionate. Both of them are so passionate. And I have the feeling that I'm looking out at a bunch of Nina and Yolande's right now, uh, people who have become so passionate on this issue, uh, that they are the faces that go along with those helping hands. And it's my job to make sure that, uh, that I help amplify the message that they are delivering all the time and, and that you are all delivering as well. Because to me, that's the, the value added that comes uh, with working with this amazing group of people. And my introduction to USAID was in April, about the same time that you were all meeting Paris to announce uh, the packet there and the work that you've been doing. Uh, but I got to USAID right before we had our first uh, White House meeting. And we were announcing what we call Room to Learn, 
which was our commitment to education first, that we would focus on conflict and crisis countries, and that uh, what we have called, or some of you may have heard us call, our goal three in our education strategy, which is to, and for the first time we put a numeric value to it, that we were going to uh, provide access to quality education for an additional 15 million children around the world. Um, and so, and, and we actually, with Room to Learn at the White House during the World Bank meetings, uh, we focused on six countries, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Haiti, South Sudan, Nigeria, and DRC. And I remember, and it was the day that, that I met Lori, uh, because she was there right around the table and, and a voice uh, for all of your concerns at the White House meeting that we had. But afterwards, when it was all said and done and we were all feeling proud of ourselves, the alarm marched up. And Lori was standing right there, and she said, not once, even though we were talking about room to learn and announcing this initiative, not once did anybody say the word conflict and crisis countries. And she was, uh, again, once more passionate and taking us to task, even when we were basking in the limelight of having had the opportunity to announce this. So uh, so I learned a very, lesson, very, uh, a very important lesson very early, and my first experience at USID has been with room to learn. And then after six weeks of briefings, they sent me to DRC in Kenya. So my first experience uh, was actually going to schools uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is one of the countries uh, where we're focusing. And I remember going to a school sort of I thought if I told you the story and I didn't tell you already that it was DRC, that it could have been in my hometown of Mount Pleasant, Iowa, because the band played and the, the children gathered and the parents were there and the officials, the local officials were there and we were given local gifts. Uh, and the brightest child in the school gave a speech and there was what I call the woman in the ubiquitous yellow dress making sure everybody had a Coca-Cola and had their refreshments. And it could have been, you know, the marching band from Mount Pleasant, Iowa, and it could have been uh, the same group of people. But the thing that is universal is that the parents were there uh, and they cared so much that their children would have equal access to education and they wanted that. And what I learned from them that day, because after the celebration was over, we sat down with the parents. And what I've discovered in both countries, I went to Kenya and DRC, is that the parents, once they realize that we are going to help their children learn to read, and they're actually learning to read, is that they want to know what next we can do. And in that particular instance, they were explaining to me uh, about the children learning to read, and I'd just been in a classroom where all the teacher had was a piece of chalk, uh, because the school had washed away and there were no textbooks, but the teacher had been trained and he had a piece of chalk and he was, he was teaching with the experience that he had. But those parents were telling me that there was something more in their school they were really proud of. And I didn't quite get it at first, even though I'd been briefed about it. And that was what you're here talking about today, is that on top of uh, just the basic education, uh, they had built into the curriculum the idea that they wanted their children to feel safe at school. Um, that they, as a community, were focusing on making sure that uh, girls could walk safely to school, that they could get the schools close, closer, that, te that there were female teachers, for instance, that the teachers were trained. And our tour, after we were done, the school had washed away, but there was a new latrine that they had built. And, you know, in this country, when I tell that story, there are always people um, giggle a little bit that I took a tour of a latrine. But it was the community coming together, as any community would, to say we want to make a commit, commitment to the children in our community, and this was important um, in order to get girls to school. So it was a very tangible lesson to me as they explained what they were doing as a community, what they were doing as parents, to make sure that not only were their children getting an education, but they were dealing with these very issues of access, and that in order to get that education, there were a lot of other things that had to be done to make sure that, uh, that children felt safe and, and secure. So I want to talk a little bit about what USAID wants to do because we want to do our fair share because we can't, none of us can do what you have proposed that we do alone. And so one of the things that we can do as a, a large agency that works throughout the world is to make sure, uh, because we work government to government lots of times, to make sure that ministers of education and, and various other ministers understand the principles that you've laid out. We want to make sure that as we de design our programs,
programs in these countries that we keep all of these principles in mind, um, that we actually go out and help promote the principles. I'm doing that right now, but I can do it as I travel around because my job is almost completely external. My job is to be the storyteller for USAID education, and while I'm telling our story at USAID, there's no reason why I can't tell the story uh, of what we're doing in conjunction with what all of you in this room are doing. Uh, we also have created our own, at USAID, our own checklist uh, for our implementers and for our missions so that as they're working that they can deal with issues of discrimination in curriculum, of making sure how to mitigate violence, of making sure that teachers are managed in a fair way, and also, as I mentioned before, how to protect the learners in our schools. So it's, it's hard work. Um, what you've decided to do. And I look at this picture on the wall of my office of, of, of a typical classroom, and I'm not even sure what country it's in. Um, and I often think about how when you vaccinate a child, you know exactly the reaction that that vaccination is going to have. It's going to be pretty much the same in every child. It's going to pre prevent certain things. But when you look at that classroom, and I look at those same children, you could vaccinate every one of them and you would know the result. But if you bring them all to a school, uh, and I look at those children, I don't know uh, whether those children had breakfast this morning. I don't know whether uh, that child was beat up on the way to school, uh, whether there was sexual violence at home, uh, whether uh, someone, whether that child had lost his or her parents to AIDS or to some sort of political violence. And so we never know when we get them in a classroom as teachers in this country or any country. Uh, all of the other components of their lives. And that's what you're doing in this room by creating this packet, is trying to equalize, to try to help stabilize the lives of those children so uh, we can come in and teach them to read that very first word, uh, like Abraham Awalovich. And I think that, um, that it's great to have the voices of the children themselves. And I think uh, not only is Abraham, and he's a little older now, but... Uh, but we also, I had the opportunity on July 12th to be at the United Nations to hear Malala speak. And what she basically said to the under 25 audience in the room uh, was that we have to pick up our pens and pick up our books. And we have to insist that every child in the world, every child in the world have access to an education. So in my work and in the work that we do at USAD, we'll follow her lead and follow Abraham's lead. And I will certainly follow the lead of, uh, of Yolande and Nina and all of the Yolandes and Ninas in this room. But thank you for letting me be with you today to be a part of this. And I will continue to learn from all of you so I can deliver our message as I travel around. Thanks a lot. Christy, thank you so much. Thank you for the story and putting really a human face on, on this work. Um, one, of the, one of the things that you said was uh, about when you talked about parents and what parents want for their kids in emergency situations. I think any of us in this room that have been in a situation of conflict or crisis know that when you ask parents what they want or what they need, one of the first things they say is that we want education for our children. And then they will say, and we want education for ourselves. And if we are not providing that, we are not being accountable to people in crisis and conflict situations that are asking specifically for that. So I just I just want to thank you for putting that human face on this on this work and also once again to thank USAID for for supporting the work moving forward. Many thanks. Um, we are going to now move to the panel uh, that will talk about the simulation that was done this morning using the conflict sensitive education pack. They'll describe their thinking around the process and the results of the workshop. I'd like to introduce Eric Eversman from Save the Children. Eric will be the moderator of the panel. We are really privileged to have Joe Kelsey from the World Bank, Mary Mendenhall from Teachers College, and Jennifer Sklar from the International Rescue Committee. Thank you all very much.
Okay. Should I slide that one? No. <laughs> Hello? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I'm Eric Eversman. I'm the Senior Director for Basic Education at Save the Children. Um, and I'm thrilled to uh, be chairing this, this panel today. And I've gotten more and more excited as, as the day's gone on. Um, our job is to connect, uh, to connect what was done this morning in a workshop of, of practitioners looking at the tool, uh, working through a number of case studies and seeing how we can uh, apply the, the, the tools that are in the pack to uh, the work that we're doing. Um, and before I introduce people and we sort of get into the details of that, I'd like to just start with a, a personal reflection and explain a little bit why I've gotten so excited as the, as the day has <laughs> gone on. I've been sort of in and around INEE for the last 10, 12 years. And I've recognized this moment when it's come. It's come a couple of times. Uh, over the last 10 to 12 years, and I sense that it's, we're here again today. And it's a moment where a um, number of people in the field from a variety of places and organizations start a conversation, start grappling with an issue. And the conversation circles around, and there's a number of side conversations, and there's uh, initial forays here and there, and eventually it coalesces. And the, that coalescence lands on a set of tools or some guidance, and it provides an inflection point which serves as a jumping off pad uh, into the future. And I've seen that happen a number of times, and I think it's happening today. Because I've seen since, I think it was 2009, maybe even a little bit earlier, when we start, started grappling with the concept of fragile states. And what did this mean for us? Because it was an idea that was coming from outside the education sector, but we knew that it was important. Uh, the working group on education in fragile states, as it was then called, was formed. There were a number of conversations. It had, I think it's, it grappled at first with what it meant, and then how does this land? But I think we see today in the, in the establishment of this pack of tools um, an understanding of how it lands for education, what conflict-sensitive education really means and how we should go forward with it. And I think that we see today a, a process really, or a point where we move from, from sort of the grappling to the, to the striding forward with some, uh, some strong tools. And I think it also, and uh, a, a compliment to INEE and the Secretariat, but also just generally to the membership. In the past when we would have done this, um, it would have started with a guidance note and then the practitioners would have said, wait, how do we actually use this? And so we would have scrambled and developed the uh, reflection tool. <laughs> and then we would have said, oh man, we're not institutionalizing. We've got to get some institutionalized. Well, then we would have developed the principles. Well, today we launch all three of them together. We've learned from the past uh, process of developing these kinds of tools. And I think you've got here a, a really wonderful and comprehensive pack. So uh, just wanted to let you know sort of why I've been so excited as the day's gone on and, I, and hopefully um, as we get into the panel a bit you'll also hear from the other presenters uh, from their own perspectives about how they actually see that um, inflection point looking forward and uh, what we're going to see uh, in the future. So I'm, I'm joined here today by uh, three people, Mary Mendenhall from Columbia University, Joe Kelsey, from the World Bank and Jennifer Scalar from the International Rescue Committee. Uh, give a little quick introduction of each and then I'm going to put a couple questions uh, to them that they can uh, use to reflect on and, uh, and as I said sort of provide a link between what we were doing this morning and then uh, the panel this afternoon. Uh, so Mary Mendenhall is a lecturer in education and emergencies within the Comparative International Education Program at Teachers College. Uh, she's a longtime INEE member in good standing. She <laughs> joined, 
the INEE Secretariat in 2005 as the network coordinator, which is the position at the time that really was the leader uh, of INEE, and she served in that role for uh, two and a half years until uh, 2008, when she became the, the lead consultant for the, the global consultation that took place in, in Istanbul and guided all of us up into um, to that uh, event. Uh, since then, she has been the project director of the IRC and uh, University of Nairobi Education and Emergencies Partnership um, and uh, remains in there as a researcher, uh, in a role as a researcher. Uh, Joe Kelsey is an education specialist at the World Bank working on the program on education resilience approaches. Uh, she has also worked with INEE in the past. She has uh, led capacity development work on INEE or the INEE minimum standards and uh, uh, other network tools. Uh, she has uh, four years of experience working in the Middle East, in Palestine, Iraq, and Syria with uh, UNESCO and Save the Children, uh, grappling with these issues uh, very directly. She also worked in the past in uh, the IAEP of UNESCO um, in the Education Emergencies and Reconstruction Unit. And uh, last but not least, Jennifer Scalar uh, from the uh, International Rescue Committee. She's the senior technical advisor there. Uh, she also, uh, we go back almost to about the same time with INEE, joined the working group on minimum standards in 2006 and was there until 2010. She's still currently actively involved in the uh, working group on um, fragility or conflict in education. Uh, and she also represents IRC on the INEE steering group. At IRC, uh, she does a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of really groundbreaking work around uh, social and emotional learning and uh, leads the, um, the work there on the healing classrooms approach. Um, so, quick introductions to each of our panelists, and I think I'd like to go, uh, just to maybe let's go in uh, Mary, and then Joe, and then Jennifer. Um, and the first question I'd just like to, uh, to put to you is this, this uh, linking question. Um, in terms of, as you participated in the, the workshop this morning, um, what kind of light bulbs went off for you, or what, what new um, maybe ideas popped up as you were engaging with the tools, and then what can you say from each of your perspectives um, as, a, as a researcher, as representing a multilateral organization or an NGO, about how you see yourself and your organizations using, using the PAC in, in the future. Great. Thank you, Eric. Um, my takeaways from this morning's session, uh, I guess I'd like to start first by commending INEE and its members for really carefully integrating the INEE minimum standards in this new tool um, and having a very harmonious approach to that. I remember when I first learned that this was a new tool coming out, I wondered how they would communicate with each other and it was clear from this morning's exercise that they do that quite well. And I think it's a great example of, of a harmonization process where one tool does not supplant the other. And so those in the field who are familiar with the minimum standards, it will feel like familiar territory as they get up to speed with the conflict sensitive education pack. Um, related to that, kind of no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> and so listening and, and talking through and, and actually discussion we had in our uh, round table and giving credit to Eric for this uh, point as well, was that you could see a need for a training module that implementing agencies would use for their own staff, for local partners that they would be engaging with on the ground, uh, as well as ministry officials, um, to make sure that all of the different stakeholders have uh, a, a firm grasp of what the CSE PAC entails and how to actually operationalize it and implement it. And certainly from an academic perspective, I can see how academics themselves, those professors who are teaching related classes, would also need to, be, to become well-versed in this new tool and would benefit greatly from um, using it uh, in their classes and then continuing to feed into uh, any efforts to strengthen the tool over time. And of course, 
agencies that are using the tool and maybe designing their own training modules could then feed those back to the IME network. It's not just the IME secretariat, of course, that has to take on that role, but all of the different members um, could come together and make sure that uh, the training modules are now complementing this three-for-one resource that's just uh, up and running. And I think related to that, another issue that came up for me this morning, and we talked a little bit about uh, in the debrief from the different case studies we looked at, is that there's still this concern around terminology and semantics, and ministries in particular, in particular uh, shying away from that use of conflict, conflict affected when talking about their own context. And so thinking about how we contextualize this type of tool to be useful and user-friendly um, for ministries in particular. And that's not new, right? We've heard this with the education and emergencies nomenclature, with the education fragility concepts. And so maybe related to the tool or the training modules that could be developed, something around thinking about alternative uh, language that could be used to, to implement and use this and make it more user-friendly for education authorities in particular. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, sort of thinking about how to use the tools, and again, it's, it's really great to have uh, all three tools, and, and they're very practically focused. Um, for me, the, the big value and what I was reflecting a lot on this morning was that we have a systematic process for doing that now. Um, and we talk a lot about having systematic processes, which is much easier said than done in, in emergency contexts. Um, and I think that, you know, with that come um, other significant advantages that it also allows us to have a shared dialogue, bringing a lot of people together around the table. So, you know, the, the bank as a multilateral, we work a lot with governments and ministries, and this provides us with um, a different point of entry, a different discussion, and a very kind of clear set of priorities and pri principles that can come out of it. But it also allows us to work with colleagues at IRC and talk about, for example, their work on socio-emotional learning and how this fits within this framework. So having that, that shared framework, I think, is, supports the coordination and, again, goes back to the standards um, around some of those kind of broader principles of how, how we can be working. Um, I would also bring out, again, what Mary said. I think, you know, we, we talked a little bit this morning about... Um, some of the, the implications of using the word conflict and for us in our work with ministries that's, you know, that's a really important consideration and so th these tools are fabulous but we need to think still it's, it's not the, the, the piece of paper is not the answer and so we still need to be thinking and continuing the discussion and the dialogue around how we work with these. Um, I know for example um, in Mali it would, it's a lot easier to talk about conflict sensitivity than it probably is in Syria. So we need to have a also continued discussion around how we how we work with these and how we have that dialogue and that advocacy that needs to be done. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I I really enjoyed the there was a session using the reflection tool and we were using an example uh, unfortunately <laughs> from uh, IRC's uh, program uh, one of IRC's programs. And it just reminded me kind of why I have been so committed and passionate to ID because it, it was that same experience where here was a tool that was a, created across agencies and we were having a discussion um, and I could have gotten very defensive, <laughs> but it was that typical situation where, I don't know, it's like magic, where people took off their institutional hat and really discussed using this, this tool um, as a way of modeling, uh, you know, that, that kind of real commitment to reflecting and being open and honest and in a safe space to really look at what our programs are doing. And I think in contexts where, gosh, the stakes are so high, where children are exposed to so much violence, where the capacity and potential to do so much harm is great, to again have this kind of interagency tool and a tool that's called reflection when we're all running around, when we're you know, just trying to implement as fast as we can, when we're uh, you know, trying to promote our, our particular approaches and in a competitive environment, to have a tool that can model um, and really encourage modeling, uh, going to the field and once again remembering why we're there and having, you know, uh, Having INI and our experience with INI and these tools help us in the field as uh, headquarters, as technical advisors, to create that culture where, when it really matters, uh, 
we actually stop what we're doing and, and have questions and reflect across agencies about what our programs really are doing. And if I can just quickly, not to throw you off too much, <laughs> but ask a quick follow-up question along the, these lines. In terms of institutionalization, um, we've gone through the process before with the minimum standards and, and other uh, tools, but a quick reflection maybe from each of you about how mainstream or, in, or institutionalization can or should take place. Are your recommendations, again, from the perspective of a researcher, multilateral NGO, um, and what you see there? Maybe just quickly one, one thought. Sure, and it allows me to ask the, or answer the second part of your first question, which I didn't do. As an academic representative, I'm being a very poor student. Um, but I think uh, two, two examples pop to mind in terms of institutionalization within an academic setting. Um, kind of obvious uh, ideas here, but uh, mainstreaming them in the courses that we teach if they have an education and emergencies focus or an education and conflict focus. Uh, not only to, to make sure that we're looking at things and examining case studies through this conflict sensitive lens, but actually to use that to then better prepare education practitioners and humanitarian workers who might be um, entering the field in, in the coming months or years. And then certainly uh, as academics who are working to expand the evidence base for this growing field um, to use this tool to help inform uh, monitoring and evaluation to some extent, but larger research efforts um, and documenting um, the nuances and the rich case studies uh, of how that's working. So from just an institutional kind of academic contribution, I could see how that would be used. Yeah, and I think thinking um, sort of a little link to that, actually thinking about how the bank works, um, we, we focus a lot on the, having the right evidence for policy. Um, and I think that what the, the conflict sensitive tools do is that they show us that we need different types of evidence coming from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's a link we need to make to academia. It's also something we need to bring into our own processes. Like, who are we asking about how conflict is perceived and how it's felt in the classroom? Does it differ between teachers? Does it differ between students? And we're a predominantly economic institution with that focus, but we also need to recognize where we can get that data and where the limitations of, us, of it are and where we need to link to other, other organizations. So going back a bit again to this idea of kind of sharing, sharing the work across different institutions and partnering and learning together. Yeah, I, I think we had a, a similar experience with the INA minimum standards where we just had this common framework for how do you define quality education. And it used to be that, you know, as a tech, the technical advisors that go out in the field had that as a framework. And then there were training the field staff. And at some point, we stopped carrying it. <laughs> and we stopped, you know, necessarily explicitly talking about INE minimum standards because it just became how we define quality education. It became the framework that we even forgot, people have forgotten, that, uh, you know, it actually came from the INE minimum standards. And so we probably need to go through the same process of, again, expanding quality of, of, of education um, and, to, and to just have it integrated into not conflict-sensitive education or INE tools, but how we think about, in these contexts, how are we going to achieve um, education for everybody and learning? And these, isn't it natural we have to think of these things? Thank you. Um, next question, I'd like to ask, uh, sort of a hypothetical, but hopefully it can, it can provide uh, some um, useful concrete recommendations. Um, if we look at a country, for example, Mali, um, there's a second round of elections coming up. There's a potential there for emerging um, from a, a, a period of conflict. If, if you look at that, what two recommendations, let's take two recommendations, that you would give to uh, USAID and, and the Global Partnership for Education about using the guidance of the Conflict Sensitive Education Pact to plan their post-election financial support. What kind of recommendations would you give there? So the two recommendations that I would suggest for Mali I think also apply to other conflict-affected countries. Um, and it came up a, a little bit in this morning's discussion. One is around time 
and actually allocating adequate time to carry out a comprehensive um, historical, you know, historic looking participatory conflict analysis. And that's certainly what is called for, called for in the conflict sensitive education pack. But I think there continues to be this perennial problem between donors and implementing agencies to actually not have enough time allocation to do that work and to do it well. And it was discussed a little bit this morning, but when I look at the guidance notes or look at the guiding principles, I don't see any explicit reference to that. And I guess I'm just wondering, you know, thinking about Molly or other contexts, a context, is there an opportunity to think about that and include it a little bit more deliberately in the guiding principles? Uh, I think, you know, INE, another one of their great um, benefits for this field is that they provide safety in numbers in terms of advocating with donors and particularly not obviously wanting to risk biting the hand that feeds you, but continuing to drive home that message that more time needs to be given on the front end to do carefully um, planned out and thoughtful assessments to be able to plan and then design and deliver uh, a, a, a responsible and responsive education program. So we talked a lot, or there was a, somebody said educating up. And so making sure, you know, with INE support that um, this idea of conflict sensitive education and time needed to do it is both downstream and upstream. So that would be one recommendation. And related to that is flexibility. So if the time isn't allocated on the front end and looking at a Mali where it's a very urgent situation, implementing agencies and other actors are very quick and want to get in there and provide education. So if there's not adequate time to carry out the, the uh, con conflict analysis, then to build that in in some way um, so that if significant changes actually need to be um, considered for adjusting the education program, that that is allowed, that donors are flexible um, in providing that support to implementing agencies, um, and that the conflict sensitive education is not just a one-time thing, right? It's meant to continue to happen. And so in the context of Mali, continuing to see how that education, um, sorry, the situation evolves and the education needs on the ground and making those, you know, that constant feedback loop of making, making improvements. And for donors to really, uh, I know they understand that, but to provide more time and flexibility to actually do that work well. Yeah, I think um, at the risk of repeating you again, <laughs> um, just in terms of sort of policy dialogue processes and thinking about how to really get the most out of these tools, I would stress two things that are sort of interrelated. And the first would be, again, this, this historical perspective and how you should be using the tool to keep that in mind. Um, so to take the situation a little bit out of the hypothetical, I was in Mali in May for about almost a whole month. And, you know, one of the things that came out of the discussions with the Ministry of the Rank, you know, we're doing this assessment and um, looking at the impact of the crisis, and they were like, which crisis are you talking about? There are so many here. You know, this has been a continuous cycle. It's been a cyclical crisis. And I think we have this great tool, and we need to think about how to use it to address some of these structural issues. And the, the tool walks you through that in a nice way, and it allows us to make explicit um, some of those deeper structural aspects um, of conflict. Um, a little aside, you know, if you're working in Latin America or Central America, which is a region that we've worked in a lot too, you've got different forms of mutating and continuing violence. You've got violent peace, or however you want to conceptualize that. Mm. Um, and so again, kind of thinking about using the tool, but making explicit some of those political economy of violence issues that we, we've been touching on in the discussions this morning. Um, the second related point that I would bring out would be to, to use the tool with a focus on how we can use it and how we can get the most out of it to bridge emergency and development. Um, the bank isn't really working as an emergency actor, but we have a lot of clout and a lot of value added around the, the development policy side. And you know, I think it's bring, coming back again to this idea of having shared dialogue and a tool that we can use to, to work across that continuum or across all of these different cycles and however the violence or conflict manifests is something that's really valuable. Um, and, you know, we talked 10 years ago about education doesn't stop just because there's a crisis or well, policy shouldn't either. And so we should be keeping that in mind and thinking about how we can use this and apply it to some of our work at those kind of larger structural levels. Thank you. Jennifer? Um, I think, uh, you know, having worked in sort of uh, these types of contexts, um, you know, you really see, I mean, you see the negative, but the positive is 
there are these sort of small windows of opportunity where there's kind of a shock <laughs> to the Ministry of Education or the systems where there actually is this opportunity to kind of reflect um, and, and a kind of receptiveness to, oh, you know, I don't really want this to happen again in my country or I don't want youth to lead a, a violence uh, violent protest or you know whatever they're, they're what's motivating them there's a period to reflect on doing something different and something around like equity for example you know where a lot of uh, governments may be you know really tied to kind of elitism elitist system or not be so invested in promoting education for everyone sometimes you know this is a, a, a time when they might reconsider that <laughs> and having a tool that kind of guides you through um, what are some of the, the consequences of not thinking about equitable education and then also um, you know in, in all the contexts that I've seen the kind of uh, resilience or solutions where uh, you know whether it's a country that's just hitting an acute emergency or been in conflict for decades where you have community-based education, you have churches that are leading education, you have parents that are paying, you have community volunteer teachers, all of these kind of opportunities to look at the resilience of some of these countries around providing education for their children and really working with governments to not see that in sort of a shameful way that, okay, you know, now the conflict's over, I gotta get back to that elite what we had before build back, <laughs> um, which was probably what caused a lot of the conflict, but to see uh, the strength of that and to look at government policies and flexible education systems and other opportunities for um, recognizing these types of education and uh, providing quality assurance and improving and building on that. And particularly for, for all these countries to recognize that, you know, again, it's this continuum, they're never just, you know, in uh, one point in this continuum and going to stay there. That in one moment they can be post-conflict, another they can be acute, another they can be development. And so to really respect and retain these types of education uh, models that have come up, um, because you never know where you're going to be along that continuum. You don't want to put all your eggs in the ministry basket. You don't want to put it all in the community. You want that balance and that variety. And I think these kinds of tools allow you to have that kind of complexity and nuanced discussion. And it doesn't have to be a negative, this is a conflict, you know, <laughs> but also to recognize the kind of beauty and resilience of what's come out of some of these conflicts and to build on that. Thank you very much to each of you for those those reflections, and I and I think that certainly did nothing to dampen my my enthusiasm from <laughs> from this morning. I mean, this is exactly I, I think where where we hoped we would we would be at this point um, to hear the reflections of, of people with such a deep um, and diverse history and background of working in this in this field, and with such concrete and I think. Uh, smart reflections and recommendations for how we take these forward. I'm, I'm very encouraged and, and excited that this, again, the, the, this pack will serve as a touchstone um, for our collective efforts going forward, um, uh, or sort of a reference point for dialogue, for collaboration, coordination, uh, policy advocacy, and certainly uh, program design. So that top to bottom uh, we are delivering um, uh, for, for so many uh, children who remain out of school or in poor schooling environments around the world. Um, and so thank you very much for the opportunity to, to, to consider all of this today and to have the opportunity both through the morning session and the afternoon here to really get to know the PAC much better. Thank you to you. There is 
so much wisdom uh, up here on within this panel and within the spe all of the speakers. Um, just a couple of things that I heard from the panel. One was uh, to give time on the front end. And I, I kept thinking as I was sitting there, a conflict doesn't start in a day. And it doesn't start in a week. Um, and people desperately need to feel heard. And providing that opportunity for time to do the kind of assessment that's needed can only be to the good. Um, when you have tools that you can work with and you have the kind of wisdom that is, is uh, obvious here. Another thing I heard was that there's a potential for this tool to be a bridge between conflict and development, which is a critical, critical gap or conundrum for us uh, in the education field between the um, development and conflict uh, situation, between development and conflict situations. And the other thing that I heard was that um, sometimes a conflict can be an opportunity. I remember being in Darfur, actually in the camps in Chad, uh, talking to people from Darfur and talking with an educator who said the silver lining in this dark cloud of conflict is that our children are in one place and can have an education, even the girls. Um, and so I do think that, that as we never want it to happen through conflict, but it does open a window at times. So just once again, thank you so much to the panelists for all of your um, <laughs> In the last uh, 15 minutes, we have an opportunity to um, engage your wisdom and your questions, comments, thoughts for any of the panelists. Uh, if you have a question, if you have a comment, I'm going to ask you to keep it succinct so that we have as much time as possible for as many people as possible to be able to participate. Um, I'm probably going to take three questions or so or comments and then allow people on the panel to respond. Two things. One, if you are, want a specific person to answer, please say that within your question or comment. And please introduce yourself with your name and your affiliation so we know who you are at the reception. <laughs> so thoughts, comments, questions. Okay, I'm going to take one. Two. Is there a third one? Three. Okay. Mark Ginsberg from FHI 360. Uh, thank, thank you to all of you um, seated behind the table and obviously many others who helped put this together. I wonder if in the simulation today or more generally in the work that is anticipated, the uh, boundaries of conflict aren't um, national boundaries, uh, particularly along economic lines, ideological lines. I mean, Mali being one case, but take many others. So I wonder if to what extent everybody in the country isn't the audience, but it is um, broader than that. Thank you. Who is next? I'm sorry, Saji. Uh, good afternoon. My uh, name is Saji Prelis with Search for Common Ground. Uh, thank you, Honorable Koma, the previous gentleman, too. Thank you for the wonderful presentation and hard work that has gone into this. Uh, I wanted to talk, to ask the question focused around the conflict analysis framework that has been the cornerstone, so to say, in this process. Uh, in countries where conflict is a bad word, are we actually inherently doing something worse by actually calling it a conflict analysis. Um, the other piece of this is we are trying to do this very quickly and because this is focused on an education packet for education and not peace building, I'm trying to see how we can change the language and adjust it to make sure that it is more practical for people who are trying to implement this in the field instead of adding another thing on their to-do list of things to do in their growing portfolio of things. They have to do good program quality design. And a good program quality design should ensure that there is thoughtful 
recognition of what are the dynamics in the country, context, changing context. So I'm wondering what kind of ideas you might have in you know, looking at conflict analysis framework versus an analysis framework itself in these dynamic places. Thank you. Right in the back, in the middle. Hi, I'm Shelly Malecki from Social Impact, and I have a question related to monitoring evaluation. Um, so, I saw on the reflection uh, tool that there is monitoring evaluation built in and some guidance on that, but I was wondering how evaluation results and feedback loops are built into these tools so that changes can be made immediately if necessary, but then in the future in programs that are designed later on, for instance, after conflict or if countries uh, move back into conflict or for different situations. Great, thank you. Let's take those three first and then uh, hopefully we will have time for one more round. Um, we have a question on um, sort of boundaries, economic, ideological, sort of, um, then we have a, co uh, a question on conflict analysis framework. Is the use of conflict a bad word? Or is the use of conflict, the word conflict, detrimental to the process? Um, conflict analysis versus overall analysis, and then how feedback, um, how, sort of how the, what the feedback loop is with the tools. So, Okay, thank you. Um, I, let me go to the uh, the use of the word conflict. I think one of the reasons that, that as sort of a consumer, but also someone who's been sort of a member of the a participant with INEE, the reason the word conflict is important to me is to is what these tools really address, and it's the relationship between education and conflict that it separates it out from other types of assessment. There's so many types of assessment, you know, for everything from just, you know, like baselines that you would use, diagnostics, I mean, there's multiple assessments. This one has a specific purpose. But in terms of communicating it to a different audience, it doesn't mean we have to stay true to the way it, it, it communicates to us. So if conflict to someone in the ministry denotes the attempt to attribute blame for, con for issues, then that's going to be obviously detrimental. So I would use a different set of terms for that, uh, and I might make some adjustments to the way I use the tools. But to call it an analysis, and I'm already in the context of conflict, they don't have to rename it such. But an analysis that helps us be sure that education promotes peace would be the way I might introduce that. So different audience, different ways to communicate. But for the purpose of the tool, I think it really gives it greater focus and greater utility to make sure that back to one of the original points and tenets of it, it helps us mitigate the possibility that we could do harm and helps us enhance the possibility that we can promote peace and stability. Yeah. Who are you pointing to? I, I to, just, to Cynthia. Oh. Right <laughs> oh, okay. It, and, and if you want to pass, you should feel free. Great. Okay. Uh, I would just agree after having worked through the development of the guidance note, I think Howard um, very succinctly described why we did include the word conflict analysis in um, the references to that piece of analysis and we fit it underneath the broader category of assessment which is described at length in the INEE minimum standards. Um, and I also wanted to add that um, there are a variety of tools in the end of the guidance note. One of them is a series of case studies and one case study in particular hi um, highlights this issue of language. It was the conflict analysis that was implemented by UNICEF in Sierra Leone. And because of these um, sensitivities around language, they chose in their work to spend the first uh, full day defining the terms and eliminating the use of the word conflict for the rest of the workshop, although functionally it achieved the same um, goals that we would have for what we've called a conflict analysis in the book. Do you want to talk Please feel free backwards. to address any of the questions, and they, you all are still mic'd, so you're okay down there. Yeah, we're mic'd. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, Mary's reminding me to comment <laughs> on up. the question about how monitoring and evaluation is integrated into the tool, and um, there are several ways that this is done. For those of you who are f familiar with the INE minimum standards, they're divided into five domains, and the first 
domain is called the foundational standards and that includes monitoring and evaluation and there's guidance on how to do monitoring and evaluation um, of quality education programming um, both in the original minimum standards as well as in this conflict sensitive education guidance book we talk about the importance of having disaggregated data and uh, monitoring elements such as perceptions of communities and the importance of having participation and these are some of the unique um, aspects that we've highlighted in the CSE pack regarding monitoring and evaluation. Um, for feedback loops, I'm not sure if you were referring to feedback to the community or findings of the evaluations, but it's um, a standard practice that whenever we ask for information from a community, be it through routine monitoring or an assessment or an evaluation, that we provide space for feeding that back to the community and certainly for conflict sensitive education that's even um, perhaps more important to make sure that we're not raising expectations that won't be fulfilled. Um, just for the feedback loop, I, mean, I think uh, you know anyone uh, implementing a program has to just have that project cycle and, and have that uh, you know intentional um, process of, of ensuring that any that there is a process evaluation that you're constantly collecting data and that's informing the design. But the tools I think really lend themselves to that. Um, you know you have the I need minimum standards and then you have the guidance note and that really provides a framework for how would you design a program that's uh, you know conflict sensitive. And then you have a reflection tool that really lends itself to, okay, I, I have a program, let me check back. <laughs> let me ask those same questions again to see whether or not uh, we really are implementing something that is not doing harm or exacerbating conflict. And then when you're doing the feedback tool, it then refers you again <laughs> to go back to um, you know, the, the, the guidance note and the resources. So it's kind of like the tools talk to each other in a way that you're almost being asked to go back from design, back to monitoring, back to design, and until you're um, dizzy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, I agree with all the comments about conflict. You know, often going into countries, you know, we don't talk about conflict analysis, we just talk about you know, you want to achieve universal primary education, or you want to ensure that your children are learning, um, you are in this context, what are the factors in this context, and what are the effects of violence, um, and what are the risks uh, of not thinking about, um, you know, how, how are we going to prevent violence in the future? And so you're not, you're not really using the word conflict, but from a personal, from my staff and myself, Certainly we all understand uh, our potential for doing harm and our own responsibility in terms of being reflective and asking these questions. And so it's important for me to keep the word in there in terms of my own, uh, our own staff and our own programs. I am going to take the first question because I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> Partly because I'll be in Lebanon next week and you'll be hard pushed to find anyone there who thinks that the conflict is bounded within those four million people. Um, and, and so I agree, you know, this is very complex and, you know, we do touch on issues of political economy, of violence and conflict, but we're also educationalists. And so thinking back to how we institutionalize this and what this means for our work, I think it means a lot around the data we collect and what we're trying to get at, right? What we really also want to look at is what happens in the classroom and what does this mean for those children? And, you know, thinking about the tool, the tool is um, very explicit and very nice in the way that it um, allows you to think about those different levels of the system and the implications around those different levels. So we might not be able to address the, you know, Iranian Saudi dynamics that might be happening in a particular place, but we can look at, you know, how do we integrate this through socio-emotional learning through classroom management practices and through different aspects of, of classroom work that still allow us to connect to those bigger issues um, but sort of follow through in terms of what, what it means to the learner in the classroom. So sort of a partial answer to that. Um, and I, I think that the tool does spell that out quite nicely. Um, in terms of the second, again, kind of reflecting conflict, um, we at the bank, we've been working on having a resilience approach. And so, you know, it's, we 
we have a slightly different concept and we bring different theory and different evidence and slightly different methodology into how we work, but we also fit very seamlessly into this larger conflict-sensitive piece. Um, and so even though we have chosen, because of the way that we work and how we dialogue um, and how we work with national authorities, we've chosen a slightly different angle, if you like. We still fit very nicely within this much bigger picture, and, and it allows us to then connect in country with UNICEF um, and save when they're running the cluster and to think about how to have the right transitions and to have that kind of dialogue across those, across the, uh, the sort of non-existent spectrum that we keep talking about. <laughs> um, I think that we're going to have to stop there. Uh, what I would encourage you to do is during the reception, please catch any one of the panelists or multiple of them and ask uh, any questions or provide comments. Um, I want to thank everyone, every one of you for attending the event today. Um, I would ask that after this event, you would think about, or during the reception, you would think about how you might want to share the Conflict Sensitive Education Pact with your colleagues uh, at work, at school, wherever you happen to be. Um, and I would also like to remind you that there's a sign-up sheet outside um, and we have meetups, the INEE meetups. Uh, we'll have another one in the fall. So if you're interested in that, please make sure we have your email address. A meetup is an opportunity for people to get together and discuss whatever topic they like on education and emergencies. Um, and this could be one of them. Um, I would like to thank all of the speakers, our keynote speakers, our, all of our panelists, um, and particularly Save the Children, FHI 360, Rachel McKinney, uh, Ken Rhodes, Lori Mosher, for all of your hard work putting this event together. I want to say on behalf of INEE, we are very deeply grateful. We are our partners. Um, we are our members, and you are our members, and I want to just say thank you. Thank you.